the most of the people joined. So even uh, basically sure. the board. Okay. Yes. Okay. So good morning um, for us on the this time zone and uh, good afternoon for, for uh, um, our colleagues uh, around the world. Uh, because I know that our, some of our students joined uh, from India and, uh, and abroad. Um, shortly, my name is Ivana Nobilo uh, and I'm Dean and Geneva campus of uh, SSBM. Um, as you know, probably, but SSBM is a global, innovative, uh, unique school with the students all around the globe. And um, as a positioning, we are, we are we stand for business experts, and we always want to develop and create a new um, and innovative programs um, in line with uh, business developments and and trends um, and digitalization and customer experience are probably the most one of the two strongest trends influencing business these days. Um, so we are already hel um, help here to help people, people on the topic with education on the topics uh, that um, are of their interest. Uh, interest. Today, um, I'm very proud to open our first digital business cafe. Uh, from today on, on, you can expect a lot of interesting lectures and presentations and uh, panel discussions with amazing guests you will see uh, first two today. Uh, from top global companies like uh, Google, uh, Meta, Zeta, Global, Oracle, Salesforce, others, you will see like really a list is extensive and amazing. Your host uh, will be my dear colleague. Um, uh, Damir Gavran. Um, he uh, teaches digital uh, transformation course um, on our MBA program. Um, but also, um, he started a new certification program, Customer Data Driven Marketing uh, and Analytics, with our president, Dr. Mario Silic. And I believe uh, Damir, you will say a bit, uh, a few words more about it. Um, Damir is uh, very active in uh, producing and um, moderating conventions uh, and webinars. Um, he also holds um, a postgraduate diploma from Columbia Business School and MIT Sloan in digital business. But not only it's not only about diplomas because da, uh, Damir has um, reached a European exper experience managing marketing and digital and customer experience team teams, um, uh, which helps him being uh, amazing as he, uh, as he is, you will see uh, today. So, uh, dear guests, please uh, feel free to ask questions during the or after Digital Cafe, uh, propose topics uh, that you would like to hear and see. And um, of course, please let us know how we are doing and uh, what uh, did you think about this uh, um, Digital ca Cafe, because your feedback is always something uh, valuable and makes us uh, work uh, better and, and, and more. So Damir, um, how are you today? You know that I can speak forever, like the, the whole day. So I think it's uh, now time um, uh, to you to take over. Um, are you ready? Did you have a coffee and everything? <laughs> coffee is definitely ready. Ivana, thank you very much for these kind and nice words. And I'm really, really happy that we are starting um, with this digital cafe. And uh, this is basically in line uh, with the dedication of my education, school dedication, that we provide the uh, best possible education in terms of, uh, as you mentioned, customer experience, digital trends, you know, mm. everything what is changing at the global economies and the businesses and it's connected to the digital. And we all know that uh, most of developments and most of the best companies in the world are very much connected to that. So besides uh, selling the products, uh, we are we are seeing more and more global companies are really focusing on selling the whole customer experience, uh, making sure that uh, we are having satisfied customers because the satisfied customers are those which uh, stays with the brand, uh, also provides some kind of advocacy and, and really supports the business on, on the long run. And, and that's why we, we, are, we are starting with this uh, program, Digital Cafe, but uh, also in parallel, uh, we are launching new education, which is certification education on the customer data-driven marketing. And uh, 
it will be basically delivered in the three ways. So one will be as an online video uh, lectures. Uh, we will have also a classroom program, but also I'm already here announcing that we are planning and, and preparing also the virtual reality at Metaverse um, uh, education on that uh, topic. Uh, before I will announce our guests, because our guests are think today the most. Please do. <laughs> yes. Um, here, uh, I'll just say a few words about the Digital Cafe. Uh, we, we, we have the format which will be really short, you know, one hour uh, uh, lectures, uh, webinars. Uh, we would have interviews inside. We'll have panel discussion in few days. And I'm uh, really um, kind of encouraging uh, all the participants uh, to, to, to send the questions, to ask, even to propose the topics you would like to see at some of the next uh, cafes. Uh, as even announced, uh, there will be global digital and customer experience leaders with us, but we will also invite uh, our professors because the school have more than 100 professors in portfolio. Uh, audiences, uh, as you might hear, you know, we have uh, DBA students, uh, we have MBA students with us, uh, potential students uh, and also other uh, digital professionals uh, which will be joining uh, and all the people which are basically interested in these uh, uh, topics. Uh, topics will be, as I mentioned, uh, related to digital, related to CRM, data, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, predictive analytics, uh, metaverse, uh, and future uh, different uh, uh, strategies. Uh, here I would like to remind you, uh, there was already communication uh, about that, uh, that uh, we so far we scheduled uh, four, uh, including today's uh, Digital Cafe. Uh, the next uh, will be every single month. Uh, here you could see the different topics uh, and, uh, and we are basically inviting you immediately to register uh, for the next uh, uh, Digital Cafes and uh, hopefully our guests uh, will be kind of of interest of you and your future kind of developments also. Hopefully we'll be able to put it on the way that you also gain some learnings, ideas, motivations uh, to move on with your work at your companies at your home. Uh, just shortly about today's agenda, um, uh, I, I will just cut it down now. So it's introduction, which is even I myself, and then we'll go on with the lectures. Uh, our today's uh, guests are uh, Dr. Christian Richter, uh, he's the global director of automotive uh, at Google. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think enormous career um, uh, experience uh, at the digital world. Uh, Christian is today with us. Uh, he's joining from Munich. And uh, after Christian, we'll have Nick White uh, from Sophos3. Uh, he will also speak about shortly about the company before his lecture so that you understand what is he doing. Uh, Nick is, uh, I know him also for <laughs> pretty similar to amount of the time like you, Yuna. And then Nick will be speaking about the digital analytics, user experiences, and all the changes you know that uh, that the business is um, going through. Uh, he'll be our second uh, guest uh, lecturer. So, so much um, uh, from me at the beginning. Please ask the questions. I encourage you. Yeah, give the comments. Uh, uh, and before we start, I would just also like to say thank you uh, for Lorena and Miro, uh, which made this possible. You know, so they are here with me. Uh, we are in the classroom at the SSBM and big thanks for them and also big thanks for the school for making sure that we have those the support so from the leadership uh, from from dr silich uh, from even as silich also ceo of the school so it's um, yeah big thanks to all that uh, this today is possible and and it's happening so so much for me i i could also talk a lot like <laughs> you said so i'll cut it short so christian how are you how is in munich today Munich is, it's actually, <clears throat> it's nice, but it's actually snowing outside. So I'm looking forward to, you know, being here in a nice digital cafe with all of you. Um, let me see if I can start my video, actually. No, I cannot start my video, but if you allow me to. Um, so, um, yeah, no, it's, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, I think what you're doing here, the entire education concept and also the topic is really, really important. And uh, it's a pleasure being here. So I'm looking forward to start the presentation. Let's see. Yep, hang on. Video works and let's see if I can share my screen. Perfect, here we go. We have it, we have it, we see it now. All right, let me go on the slideshow perfectly. Well, um, so my name is Christian Richter. I had the automotive business for Google um, for the advertising uh, business. So that means anything that has to do with 
um, advertising and selling cars. We do have the ads, but there's also um, our colleagues from cloud and from Android. And of course, if you look further across um, entire alphabet, you also have the Waymo self-driving cars. However, I'm really, really focused on how to sell and market vehicles. And so this is why today I'm going to talk about omnichannel, which is sort of the new normal happening in auto. And if you look at auto, there are three teams that are driving the industry. Actually, it's four if you look at semiconductor shortage also, but I think this is this will go away eventually. But the big themes is the first one is really driving its electrification. Then it is um, the how the cars experience a connected car. And of course, um, how the cars purchase, which is uh, the entire part of channel disruption. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. If you look at, and I think this is a good way to see how a big external event can really, really change and disrupt an industry in a sustainable way. Um, what you see here is the search volumes for online car shopping. So everybody who um, actually wanted to buy a car um, online and has expressed this online. And even I've just created, you know, took one brand, which is close to home here to Munich Audi as an example. You see, this is not just true for the entire industry. This is also true for um, individual brands themselves. Um, but what you actually can see is you can see that during COVID, the consumer intent to buy cars online has significantly gone up. But when COVID went away, when everything opened, car dealerships, everything opened again, actually the consumer intent stayed at this level. And we see this across auto. We see this across pretty much all branches of retail. People got used to buying stuff online. People got used to doing stuff online. And even so, um, traditional retail is open again. The demand for online services is staying high. So that change is sustainable. The other thing also what you can see is how many people, we actually ask people, we have a panel for this, we ask people how many people would actually like to buy a car online and purely online. And you see that it's between 35 and 15%, depending on where you are, 21% is the average. That means you still have 80 to 7 to 65% that still in a way want to visit the dealer. And I think that's important. You cannot just rely on one channel. What you need to do is you need to be able to work across online, but also across the traditional retail channels, also other channels like, for example, call centers and so on uh, to make it work. So the real challenge is to work omnichannel. Yeah. The other thing what we've seen is um, we've seen a lot of new players in the industry come up. Players like Carvana, Room. Kirby, Driveway, and so on. So all of the pure players that, you know, where you can only transact online as a delivery to your car to your doorstep that do not need a traditional retail network anymore. That's another thing what you see when this happens. You have new players that are capitalizing and building uh, on the trend and building new business models. And if you're an incumbent, actually, if you're a car manufacturer with traditional retailers and dealers and everything, you have to react to this because eventually this becomes a question of channel control. So here's the challenge, the real challenge in selling cars. And this is a data challenge. This is real data actually of a car purchase journey. So when you measure all the touch points a customer has across the websites, the dealers, the call centers, web forms, online forms, uh, whatever. And overall, a typical car buyer journey has over 900 touch points. So that's a lot of data to manage, but also to, to work with and look for patterns, look for trends. And the way to solve big data challenges is with AI and machine learning. Um, just if you ever hear the two things, um, maybe that's something for one of your next exams at uh, SSBM. What's the difference between AI and machine learning? AI is the science of making things smart and machine learning is a technique used to develop AI. I think what's also important how AI machine learning works is if you think about classical linear programming, 
classical programming works, you have input plus algorithm, and then the machine gives you the output. AI and machine learning works different. You don't give input plus algorithm, you give input plus output, and then the machine builds the algorithm. And what you give as input is all the data, for example, from the customer journey here. What you give as output is, I want you to sell a car. I want you to sell a car at the best possible margin. So basically the output is a desired success event. And then you let the machine figure out what the best way is to work with the data to get to this desired success event. It could also be in other forms of AI. It could be X-ray pictures of the lung and you tell the machine to learn if there is cancer or not in the lung, for example. And you just feed it with a lot of data. And so eventually it learns to interpret these images by itself. And the way usually these formulas comes up, they're very nonlinear. They're usually not human mind driven linear programming is working. And I think this is very, very important in the big difference between classical linear programming and machine learning and AI. At Google, when we innovate, we use this framework. We always say, we'll, for example, use it at, at our X labs. Um, and while we always say we need a huge problem, so really, really, really big problem, then we need to add some breakthrough technology and also a radical solution in the way the entire business is operated. For example, when we look at innovation and AI, Huge problem was deep learning and data. So again, a lot of data, which is just way too much traditional computers could handle. The breakthrough tech are GPUs, which is a special processor optimized for cloud computing and machine learning. And the radical solution, for example, then that came out of it was a computer that could beat humans at Go, which is the most complex game in the world. So how could this look in business? Now, this is a picture of, for example, how a AI would do customer segmentation. This is called, the technique is actually called K-clustering. And what you see is that the machine learns to segment data points based on similar behavior. And when you do this, for example, you find out segments that have a much higher propensity to buy a specific product than others. And again, this is way more advanced and the traditional way of segmenting when you have whatever these sigma milieus, the upper liberals or the progressive conservatives or whatever, um, because these are segments where from a traditional segmentation approach, you would probably never have come to address these customers um, with the specific investment and the specific return here. Also what we do at Google, we put AI at a lot of uh, what we do. So we use it for assistance, traffic predictions, online fraud detection, delivery services, unique and personalized recommendations. So once you have the technique and once you have some mechanism, think about lots of data in and you tell the algorithm, what is the success event to predict? For example, predict that a certain action is a fraud online and learn it. And with the time you get really, really, really good at flagging this is with very high likelihood an online fraud attempt. For example, this is what you do. So always think about when you work with machine learning and AI, this is the very, very basic principle behind. And we use it and it's been used in different industries. Again, whenever there are large data sets and very, very, very complex problems. In manufacturing, predictive maintenance, for example, it's a big thing in retail, um, upselling or ROI and lifetime value modeling. In health and life sciences, disease identification, proactive health management, in travel and hospitality, congestion management, dynamic pricing, risk analysis and financial pricing, and power usage analytics and energy and utilities. For example, we use at Google, we use AI to manage power in our data centers. And we manage to reduce power consumption by 40% by giving AI control about really how to cool places, how to light places and all of this and really, really optimize for um, power consumption here. And as you know, data centers use a lot of power. So for example, if you are in the automotive business, what can you do with AI? You can use it to optimize 
marketing ROI using advanced marketing analytics, understanding this is the, the journey, predicting marketing outcomes, personalizing a customer experience. You can go beyond pure marketing and think about the entire journey. You can integrate the data along what happens on the manufacturer side, what happens at the dealers, the call centers, everything. You can even start to automate what's happening in the call center with an AI behind it. Um, you can create virtual showrooms, for example. Think about a brand like Volkswagen has 50 models around about, more or less. There's almost no showroom big enough anymore to put 50 models in one showroom. And then think about all the colors, all the different interiors and everything. So, and think about the real estate costs that come with it. So once you basically think about it, why not really create virtual versions of showrooms? Um, you can get more into selling more and smarter, which is all around planning and forecasting. What's the next product to buy? Think about accessories, um, service subscriptions, charging, charging plans with electric vehicles, um, and also think about monetizing the data that's actually happening in the car. So think about all the data an electric vehicle generates by charging every day. If you have an EV, you have an interaction with the system multiple times a day, actually. That's a lot compared to where it used before where you buy a car and if you're lucky two years later, you show up at the dealer. So again, a lot of data to work with, a lot of business models uh, to come out of this. So think about this, then think about the three circles again. The big problem is there's a broken end-to-end -end omnichannel experience because customers expect to move seamlessly between parts of a business that historically did not need to be connected. So the tech is really AI and cloud to integrate the data along this entire customer journey. And the radical solution coming out of it's actually a true omnichannel organization that reaches across OEMs, dealers, and their partners. And I think that's also a very important thing. You can optimize the best out of your tech if you don't change the business model behind, if you don't change how organizations, procedures, and talent is operating, you will never get the best results out of it. So if you're a business leader and you need to go through digital transformation, the one part is the tech, very important, but think about structures, processes, people, and talent at least as important as the tech part here. So with this, I'll leave you. I am on time, I see. Thank you very much. And um, looking forward to the panel conversation in a few minutes. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Christian. If you could just stop your presentation so that uh, the audience could see us. Well, excellent, thank you. So <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. And uh, it, it was about uh, the content, about the digital, about the artificial intelligence. Uh, we will be basically continuing this discussion later in the panel. But before we move to Nick, maybe Christian, a few words about Google, about yourself. So how long you are in Google and how is to work in the, in the Google uh, those days? We see that uh, basically you are sitting in Germany and you are globally responsible uh, for one part of the Google business. So how do you feel? How, how is there? Uh, well, I mean, to answer your first question, I'm with Google for 13 years. I was 10 years in management consulting before actually specialized in automotive and aerospace before I joined um, Google. Google is a great place, I have to say. It's, of course, it has come a long way over these 13 years. Um, I mean, back then, it was pretty much all desktop search, and then YouTube came, and then Android came, cloud computing came, and all of this came. So but it still has the very innovative spirit, even so it's a really, really big company with more than 100,000 employees uh, uh, and so on. But it still has the, you know, the healthy disregard for the impossible. Plus I think, you know, it's pretty much one of the largest computers on a global scale uh, behind of all of this, plus a lot of talented people to work with. Um, so I, I really, really can say even, you know, after 13 years, I still enjoy it a lot. It's fun, it's innovating, it's, um, it's still with a very, very high pace, but you know, I mean, that's 
you know, that comes with it. And I think that's, that's also the good thing about it. So, um, yeah, I, to answer your question, I like being at Google. I'm actually personally looking forward to like pretty much all of us. I've worked with a lot of people around the globe. I talk to them on a screen for more than two years. And finally, we are going back to seeing people in person again. And I'm really, really, really looking forward to that. Excellent. So as we have lots of uh, people on the call from kind of students community, I say students, sometimes they're proud if they're MBA students having 35 years old, 35 years old, they say, thank you very much for calling us students. So we still have lots of students around. So is there is any message for them? What kind of skills Google is looking for? And if they want to apply for Google jobs, is that publicly available? What, what's your recommendation, you know? So how do you find the right talents for your company? Yeah, I mean, the first one is google.com slash jobs. All jobs that are, you know, open for external hiring are actually posted outside. So, and um, then I think, um, yes, of course, you have to be good in your, you know, in, in the way, from, from your academia and, 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 and all of this, yes. But I think the most important thing is to have a good way of solving problems, a good way of, yeah, I would almost call it general cognitive abilities to really think about how do you solve problems? How do you navigate ambiguous problems and boil it down to what are the two solution dimensions for solving this, for example. Yeah. So I think it's a lot more about, and I think this is also, if you, if you, if I think back to my own university days, you pretty much forget what you had to learn for a specific exam or so, but what you take on is really the way to process a lot of information very, very fast and solve it in a structured way. So I think a lot of this is really about just being a good problem solver. And I think also very important at Google, we are very, because we, you know, we have all these different teams, uh, products and so on. So a lot of this is actually the ability to work across lots of different teams, lots of, lots of different cultures, um, leading with influence, but also leading without influence. So getting people behind a certain agenda by really making them believe that this is the right thing to do. I think that's also very, very important. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, we'll come back to you as uh, after uh, Nick's presentation, uh, we would uh, have also panel discussion. I'll keep some questions about artificial intelligence, about the data for you, but uh, I'll come with those uh, uh, back uh, to discussion a bit uh, later. So thank you very thank much. You. I'll have a coffee in the meantime. <laughs> thank you. Enjoy fun. your coffee. That's very good. So uh, our second guest, um, Nick White. Uh, how? What's the weather like uh, in UK today, Nick? Before we start, because I think weather is very important in UK. Uh, yeah. Well, you should know it's typical British weather. Um, it's raining. It's windy. But I'm indoors and I have coffee, so I'm happy. Good. Few words about yourself and, and the company before you start, but you could already start presenting. And basically, Nick, the floor is yours. I'll also have a few questions for you after you finish your presentation, and then we will go to the presentation. So basically, floor is yours. So please start with your presentation. And I'm also taking my coffee. <laughs> okay. Well, wow. Don't you love it when technology works? Look at me. There you go. You've got me in browser. Can you see me in the um, presentation? Yes. Okay, I, I'll cover those points. Um, I mean, just again to reiterate, I, I'm Nick White. I'm the commercial director um, at Sophos Free. Um, I've been taking on board the subjects that Damir said and, and, and what Chris has been talking about. Uh, and it all comes down to the words of the, the good Lord, Bob Dylan. You know, the times they are a changing. And we've got to embrace change to understand how we have to work um, in the modern digital world uh, where data really is everything. So I'm gonna give you sort of three parts to what I'm gonna talk about. First of all, I'll give you my journey here. 
how I got to my position today, uh, which maybe is similar to some of you um, who are doing your MBAs or doing your studying. I'll give you one minute on what my company does. Just one minute. So you understand what we do. Um, then I'll look at it, wh wh where's manufacturing, where's industry been? Uh, and I'll use the car industry as an example, but it applies to many industries. I look at you know, the last hundred years of sameness uh, and followed by the major disruptors in the industry, which are not just for cars, but for other industries as well. Um, and finally, moving on to the subject that we've been talking about, it's, you know, data, data everywhere. Um, how do we analyze that data? What I will say about data, it's not about data, it's about the insight, which we believe is key. You know, data is information, insight is, is real knowledge and power. Uh, and, and then look at omnichannel retail, analytics and engagement. And finally, if there's enough time, a few discussion points, but um, stop me if I go on too long. So um, I'm, I'm a changing man. Um, I started my career as a microbiologist. Um, this is many, many years ago. I was obsessed um, with the microbiological world. Now, lucky for you all, I, I'm no longer there. Um, if I was, we'd still have COVID for another 10 years. Um, basically, um, I was useless at it and realized it at a very early age uh, and actually moved on. Um, in fact, moved into media. Uh, a very obvious point of movement. I worked in media for 25 years, uh, published several international magazines, uh, headed up global development for one of the UN North America's largest publishers. Um, I spent my life split between US, Europe, and a lot of time in Japan, Korea, and as it was then, the emerging Chinese market. So a lot of time based uh, internationally, um, understanding how business works on, on a global sales scale. Um, but then some 10 years ago, I moved into software as a service uh, and analytics. Um, now, what I will say is the analytics side was a revelation to me. Um, it's an area which has exploded in recent years uh, and, and allows me to talk with people across the whole organization from the C-suite down to every department head. Um, and I'll go back to this issue again. Analytics is just one part of it. It's the insight you gain that I'll always go on about it is the key thing. So that's my journey to this point. Um, let me briefly give you an insight into the organization I work for. Uh, and um, we have, so for three, we have three key areas of business. One is analytics. Um, we look at the mass movement of consumers across websites um, and, and see where they're moving. But we also work very deeply with organizations, um, managing their global analytics and linking it to their CRM, CRMs. So we can understand the full end-to-end -end chain of a customer's journey from first point of contact right through to sale and then beyond the sale, in terms of customer retention. Um, there's a second side, which starts to earn on to the omni-channel, uh, and, and as Christian mentioned earlier, virtual showrooms. Uh, we, we do virtual showrooms for 20 different, uh, 22 different brands now around the world, helping them connect online with their customers. And the third part is actually training and coaching. This is an offshoot. Um, we discovered from all of our work that a lot of organizations, and you may have this in your own companies you work for, are very heavily siloed. And it's especially true in the digital world. The digital departments have only been in existence for maybe 10, 15 years in many companies. They're often stuck in the basement, they're fed pizza from time to time, and they have no association with the rest of the company. Well, what we're doing is we're bringing them into the fold across different organizations and helping marketing understand digital. They should, but they often don't. Helping the C-suite, the, the board members understand digital finance and making digital part of everyday life. It, it's, it's sadly not happening in many, many organizations 
Uh, and, and I'll be fascinated to know from, from people later if you have those sort of similar challenges. Let's um, move on. Um, 100 years of sameness. And I'm going to use the car industry as an example of how things have been very comfortable for many organizations for a long time. So you look back to the first car launched in what, 1865, uh, the Benz. Um, for the last 100 plus years, it's been a story of heavy manufacturing, producing vehicles designed based upon what they believe is right for the customer, and sent out to dealers, in fact, sold to dealers who retail it on their behalf. As a system, it has many faults and many issues. Um, and it, 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 there's often a disparity between the two. So what retail want and what the car brand wants is often not the same. And that's a real issue that the industry has had, but it's had the same system in place for over a hundred years. There are many other sectors you could look at that suffer from the same issues. But let me introduce you now to what we call the four horsemen of the automotive apocalypse. Um, Christian's already mentioned um, three of them. Um, we like to think it's electric vehicles, um, which you're all pretty familiar with. The area of car sharing, which will become more and more important, especially in city areas where people can't afford to keep cars or actually um, kind of even charge a vehicle. Uh, connected cars is a massive issue, and I'm gonna dwell on that in a second, and then followed by omni-channel retail. These have all come over the last 10 years. So the car industry is being revolutionized overnight. And again, I I'd ask you to look at your industry and give me examples as well. So let's look at Connected cars, um, it's sort of data, data everywhere. So give you an example. The average saloon car these days produces 25 gigabytes of data per hour. That's a huge amount of data being produced, which is often fed back to the brand or sometimes even a dealer, but also to third parties, maybe such uh, as uh, mobile phone operators and navigation companies. Um, it's going to get even more. The autonomous cars. Um, Germany's recently announced that they're allowing uh, level four cars uh, on the road, which is basically nearly full autonomy. That will produce 3.6 terabytes of data per hour being fed back to the brand or the dealer. This data is all coming through. Um, compare it with the average 737, that's 20 terabytes of data per hour. So you can see all you need is six vehicles and you're producing as much data per hour as a jetliner coming across the Atlantic. Uh, and this goes back to one of the comments Christian made that the use of AI is going to become so important because the data volume is so immense. We're going to have to have AI to analyze it and produce virtually instantaneous results. Now let's look at the world of omnichannel, um, omnichannel retail. And again, just to define what omnichannel actually is, omnichannel is anything where it may start in a digital world, but ends in, in the real world, um, uh, at a dealership. It's any point of interaction with a customer, real, unreal, wherever you want to have it, um, that is omnichannel. And we should never, ever forget the human element of this. Because in every purchase, often human beings will still be involved. So let's focus first of all on omnichannel on analytics. And I'm going to give you an example of how it works in the real world. I'm going to show you some dummy data. But this is how it can work in the real world um, using our solution, in fact, at Sophos Free. So let's take uh, the new Opal Astra and that being launched. Um, when the product teams and the marketing teams look at the vehicle, they'll have what they think is a good idea of who their true competitor set is. 
Well, I mentioned the research we did earlier. We can actually look at where customers have been before and after visiting an Astra on Opal's website. It could be my website, it could be the dealer websites, and that's internationally. Again, dummy data, we can actually tell um, Opal precisely what vehicles are being looked at post looking at the Astra. In this case, we're saying the Tucson or the Qashqai. Now with that segmentation, you're starting to understand your true competitor set. You're starting to understand who are you really competing with? Now, who is that important to? Obviously the marketing department, they need to know that. The digital department uh, need to understand it so they can target their, their, their Google ads at the right competitors. The product team need to understand it so they know who they're actually competing against. And actually the retailers need to understand it so they know what's going through customers' minds when they're looking at the vehicle and who they're comparing uh, the Astra with. So this is a real example of how data can be taken and provide insight and give real practical use um, at, uh, at a brand level. Now, uh, this could be used for any product. You know, I've chosen the example of an Apple Series 7 watch. Um, you could use it to look at how market segmentation happens there, what customers are doing before and after visiting that watch online. So you can build up a true picture of who your competition are. So hopefully now I've illustrated a, a real life uh, a, a example of analytics and how it can be used in, in, in Omnichannel. Um, the next part is let's look at Omnichannel retail and the role of digital. And, and let's take a step back. Um, we all use websites. Websites are amazing for getting information. They're amazing for guiding you in a, in a, in a journey. Um, and as a, a, a company, they're great for getting data about what your customers are looking at. But the one thing a website is not, it's not human. It's terrible about having a human interface. And Christian heard upon this earlier, the use of virtual showrooms. And that's precisely what we do. So we host virtual showrooms. And for those interested, I can send you examples later where through the website, you can have a direct one-to-one -one conversation with a customer or a customer can talk to the brand, to a retailer about a particular product. They can give, give live guided tours of a product. Um, they can be shown exactly all the way around it without ever having to step in front of a retailer. Importantly, it errs into the e-commerce world e-commerce when you're buying online. Now, when you're talking of high-end products, um, our own research shows that 95% of people who start an e-commerce journey do not complete it. And that's for expensive products like cars. So they'll start the journey, they'll configure the car, they'll go through finance. When it comes to pressing that button on the bottom right of the screen, they just don't do it. So we've introduced live chat video virtual showroom so the uh, a, a, a dealer or retailer can help a customer in those final steps of decision making basically holding their hand uh, to make sure that they're comfortable with the decision they're making um, and that really is a, 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 the way things are moving forward we see you know bridging the gap between in-store and digital having a human being actually interact with customers. That is a, a true example of, of, of Omnichannel. Um, I myself have worked on many projects. I did one project with a, a major organization, it's another car company, where they were frustrated that the demographic audience was 85% male over 55. Very frustrating. So we developed a concept of the digital journey being exactly reflected in store. So in store, they had purely touch screens, no salespeople. Overnight, it flipped 55% female and uh, so in the region of 40% under 40. 
So a huge switch in demographics by changing from being, you know, a, a, a traditional store um, where you're presented with people sitting at you across a desk, almost quite intimidating, to a store which is digital led, which open it up to a completely different set of people. Um, that's all I'm going to say about Omnichannel. You may have some questions later. I'm going to throw a few sort of couple of things out there, by the way, which are also issues facing the car industry. Um, and that is the emergence of other markets, such as China. China has been an amazingly positive influence on the car industry. It's accelerating the change with EVs, but the car industry is still getting its head round it, round it. Still doesn't quite understand how these new manufacturers are coming in. And the third one, or the final one, is is chips. You know, and, and for any of you doing your MBAs at the moment, it's worth actually devoting a whole study on this. Um, the, the bad news overnight uh, of Russia and the Ukraine will send chip prices through the roof again. Um, I don't know if you know, but Russia is the world's biggest exporter of palladium, which is used in chips. And if there's going to be a trade war, it's going to get a little bit more unpleasant, not just for the car industry, but for any sector which is technology led. Um, and, and that is a major impact on, on the way people are operating. So um, there we go. More than happy to dig in deep on any of those subjects, or you can ask me any questions now. Thank you very much, Nick. Maybe you just click um, uh, to, to stop the presentation so we could see each other. And I suggest that uh, we uh, just move on in our panel discussions. I have a few questions um, here. And uh, basically, uh, maybe, maybe the first question could be uh, for Christian. So, I, I mean, collection of the data, Christian. I, I think everybody understands, you know, tagging and online side. But how else the companies could uh, collect the data in omnichannel journeys? Because I think the main trend which we see currently is that uh, not only about digitalization of, let's say, traditional companies, but we have a companies like Amazon, which are basically moving on more into the retail environment and uh, opening, you know, retail stores, uh, uh, buying uh, companies which have many uh, retail stores, uh, especially in US. So how is about that side, you know, so in, if you think about the omnichannel journals and the data from the uh, kind of physical environment? Yeah, uh, by the way, for some reason, I cannot start my camera. So um, anyway, so I, I'm just going to talk. Um, I think, I mean, first of all, uh, I think in the back end, you need to bring the data together. So wherever you have, um, you know, data collection opportunities in the physical world, you need to make sure that they're connected and not live in an outdated um, system and uh, i think there are two things to to look for when you do this the first one is um you can do this either brownfield or greenfield brownfield means you take existing systems and you connect them to a data lake or a cloud that brings it all together or if you say this takes too long you could also say i'm going to do this greenfield greenfield meaning i'm just going to put a new system on top of it. For example, if you are at a dealer and um, you know the old system is really, really outdated, you just deploy a new system and it just gives the sales staff tablets where the new system runs. And they say in the old system, uh, well, maybe you can put your coffee cup on the old computer. I don't really care. It comes with more speed, but of course you have to pay double until you know the old contract or the old tech runs out. So I think that's it's usually it's the question of speed um, versus this uh, cost here. The second thing is um, you need to be very cognizant about um, first party data and um, user rights here. So you need to not just collect data, you also need to collect consent. And this is very important in pretty much every part of the world now. So this isn't just about data collection, it's also about consent collection. Sometimes you collect consent in one part of your system, but the other part of the system, system doesn't know that you have collected the consent, so it cannot legally work with the data. So you don't just need a 
holistic data management, you need to have a holistic consent management with it also. Okay, um, the, you touched one thing, Christian, now, and I think you could put your back on camera, so you got- Yeah, the... yeah, sorry, for, for some reason it didn't work. No, no. Uh, so, what about the third party cookies? We know that the tracking must probably change. I mean, you mentioned that uh, in some of the part of your speech, you know, so uh, how is Google planning with that? I, I guess, you know, I mean, from one side, we have demand from the customers for higher personalization, and on the other side, we have something which is contradictory, to increase the level of the data privacy. So how are you are planning to basically address these two kind of opposite positions? Yeah. So uh, I think long-term the cookies will crumble, <laughs> to say it in that way, the cookies will crumble. Uh, why? I think the first thing is uh, regulation is going towards, if you think about EU, but also the US, about India, about pretty much all the parts of the world. Um, collecting data um, without consent and all of the frameworks will pretty much make third party cookies, you know, legally no longer viable. That's the one thing. The other thing is um, you also see tech changing. I mean, Apple started it with uh, iOS, but you see more and more tech and operating systems also um, making third party cookies impossible. So, when you take both together, I think whatever you do, whatever you build now as a data infrastructure, it needs to be based on first party data. If you want this to be future proof and a true durability in the solution. Yeah. So, and this is, by the way, what we are working for long term with Google. You've seen all the announcements our company has made over the last year. So, um, I think this is really, I know this is a journey. So this is not, you know, binary uh, switch on, switch off, but eventually more and more parts of the world and more and more parts of the tech landscape, operating systems and so on will move towards first party data only. And getting ready for this is a long-term uh, effort. And just from Google, we've started this journey a um, year and a half ago about, and we working with all our partners uh, on this. And uh, I mean, this will take time, but I think whatever you do, whatever you build and put in place now, this needs to be first party data-based. I fully agree, Christian. And our April uh, digital cafe will be fully focused on that. Uh, we'll speak about data-driven marketing. Uh, we will have a guest uh, from Axiom, senior vice president and from Zeta Global. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about the customer data portals, uh, brand gardens uh, and the first party data uh, strategies. My last question, because we are very short with the time and we are already at 11 o'clock, but I still would like to hear from Nick. So Nick, we, uh, we today we discussed a lot about artificial intelligence, you know, how far do you see this going? You know, would, would we all going to lose our jobs or, or, or you believe still there is a place for humans in the future to, to have jobs, maybe different jobs. So how do you see that? And how do you see ethical side of the artificial intelligence going into the many of those um, uh, uh, jobs and, and uh, yeah. That's a very good question. I, I, I think that the, the major benefit of AI is the speed that you can get information, but you still need people to talk through what does it actually mean for your organization. Um, so it will help in decision-making massively so, but to believe it will answer everything. No, I don't believe it will. Um, there'll still be roles for people to interpret it and then action what that data means. So it, it still needs actioning. Um, you still need to do things. So mm -hmm. embrace it, you know, embrace it, you, you know, use it um, and, and learn to think how it can benefit your company um, and employ people to then put its actions into place. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for, for that answer. So I guess it's 11 o'clock. Uh, we are learning also. So <laughs> with the concept, we are trying to uh, be as quick as possible and still deliver some of the messagings. You know, uh, I guys we, with you, I could be talking for hours. Unfortunately, due to the sake of the time, I have to stop at the moment, you know. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your participation.
And before we are coming to a full stop and end, you know, I would just like to remind uh, that in March uh, we would have our second uh, digital cafe. Our guest will be Pietro Leone. He is the ex CEO of WPP, of the marketing agency, and currently he's basically running as a CEO uh, Lens Marketing, a new digital agency. And Maria Kleich, she's the senior marketing manager of Opel Vauxhall Europe. And we'll be basically talking about marketing paradigms and how the roles of the marketing teams, marketing agency change from, let's say, 25, 20 years ago to today. Because we all know this definitely changed with uh, the facts we were talking today, with the uh, ch changes and developments of the technologies. And with that, also the work and how we position the marketing, how we run the marketing is changing. And our guests will talk more about that once again from one side, from the agency side, and from another side, from the client side. So I expect a very interesting and dynamic discussions from Pietro and Maria in, in, in March. So um, we would try to answer your questions. I have seen some questions uh, uh, in, in later as a, as a kind of follow up. Unfortunately, we have to stop now. Uh, please join us uh, at March, you know, we'll try to be better, send us your suggestion, send us your additional questions, so we'll come back to you, and uh, for the time being, that's all, and uh, once again, thanks for the participants, thanks for the crew helping us, uh, Miro Lorena from the school, Ivana, uh, which was uh, today with, with us on the call, and Thank I wish you. you a great uh, day to all of you, so all the best. Goodbye. Thank you, guys, and see you in Geneva. Thank Nick, you. Bye-bye. Uh, uh, Take care, everybody. <laughs> bye. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Uh, bye.